Okay, we're going to move to what I said, and I promise would be the most controversial part of this particular uh, session today. Uh, I want to talk about deliverance. Uh, when we were doing deliverance the, the old way, when we first started seeing people manifesting demons, uh, we didn't know what we were doing. First, we would just command things to leave by force. The problem was, weeks later, we would see the same things recur. We would see similar problems with the same people, and we realized we had no idea what we were doing. And so when we didn't know what we were doing and knew we didn't know what we were doing, we referred to methods that we learned were not the best methods in the world. In fact, they weren't something that I would recommend at all. And so we begged God, and he unlocked some things with us that permitted us to see with precision what was going on with our people, and we proceeded to assist our people with deliverance. So I want to share with you what we've seen, what we've learned. We have done at least a 1,000 deliverances. I have no idea how many. We do them all over the world because people call in with us. Literally every day we take a call at 6.30 a.m. our time. Before we get up, before the children are up, and before we get about our business, we do a deliverance on the phone. Okay, That doesn't even include all the people being brought to our house constantly. Okay, So... Uh, we have learned quite a bit. We have, we have developed a mental database of all these different circumstances that we've encountered uh, in that time. And so whether or not you believe me is up to you, but the practical part of it is what I'm hoping you'll take away from because it can help people. It can help people big time because our church, it's probably the most important neglected thing in our mission, okay? Besides the power and the leading of the Holy Spirit. But deliverance, people were still in bondage and they didn't know how to be set free, okay? That's the best way to, uh, to look at it. When we were part of the world, we've given ourselves to the world and to Satan and to sin in certain ways. When we abandon those things, and when we surrender our life to Christ and we're baptized, okay, it does say in the Bible that by his stripes we're healed. But when we go in the water and come out of the water, our sicknesses don't automatically go away. Do you understand? Water doesn't make them go away. Nor does water automatically chase all the impacts and influences of the spiritual forces of darkness on our life. Okay? Now, there are remarkable changes that do occur, and I, I, I'll touch upon some of those things, but... It is not automatic. Deliverance is a process. It is something we need to participate in. And before I experienced some of those things in my own life, I honestly, we used to always do a spiritual inventory with people and identify stronghold sins and areas of victimization. And we used to renounce those things, repent of our sins, and release or forgive those people that we have wronged to break the chains that Satan had with us. And we would pray with force. And honestly, some people were getting delivered, but we had no idea what was going on behind the scenes because we couldn't see. You understand? We had no idea. When we started experiencing all these manifestations of demons and realizing that what we did was not a permanent solution, we knew we were beyond our capabilities. Okay? Then also, when we were getting bombarded with this constant witchcraft that was coming against us, and we didn't know how to deal with it because, I'll be honest, there's nobody out there that talks about witchcraft when it comes to deliverance that I've seen. Okay, but um, And when, when, the, when the light bulb flashed that witchcraft is just demons, we were immediately empowered because we realized that all power and authority is even granted to us to deal with demons. And witchcraft is just demons. And then we had a lot of people with generational curses. Well, that's just demons. You just break the curse, you deal with the demon. I mean, and so we were quickly empowered. And so when God activated the gifts that allowed us to discern exactly what was going on against our people, uh, this is why it's important for us here today, is because by seeing what's going on behind the scenes, we were able to instruct people who can't see what they need to do to deal with those things. Do you understand? Because we're not the only ones doing deliverance with great success. Okay? The other brothers are too. And with the things that I'm going to share to, with you, I've actually 
like field tested some of this, so that I would do something blindly and deal with with you know doing deliverance blindly without using the gifts. Then I would go back and double check with the gifts and see how we did. And we're getting a greater than 90% success rate on completely delivering people blindly. Okay. Now, you would do deliverance for a couple different reasons. One is to prepare people for baptism. Okay. When we go through repentance and, and all that, we want people to be completely cleaned before they hit the baptismal waters. The other reason is just for cleanup. I mean, people are being attacked. There's something wrong with their life. You normally want to address a particular issue. Let's say it could be a sickness. It could be a mental problem. It could be an emotional problem. And so you want to do deliverance to solve something specifically. Okay? And uh, in both cases, you would approach it a little differently because when you are preparing somebody for baptism, you want to be comprehensive. So we would it would be more of an interview process, understanding what's going on in their life, in their past, strongholds in their family, any victimization or emotional uh, harm that's come their way and trying to identify all the things that that might be they might that might be attacking them spiritually okay when you're dealing with a particular issue you want the spirit dealing with that issue you understand and so you might not be going through an interview process you might literally be praying for somebody it might be a public setting you understand so you're not going to be interviewing this person about their personal strongholds in a public setting because you're just praying for healing so you're going to deal with that particular issue. So it would be a little different. Okay. Uh, using the gifts, we're able to actually pray for people and identify what's there. We can literally see what's there with precision. Okay. Then we attack everything by name. We attack it by work. Typically, we get their work, not their name. Okay. And uh, I can give you an example. Just a week before we came here, we had six people prepared for baptism. The brothers prepared them. Went through their repentance, identified their sins, their strongholds, their generational strongholds, and areas of victimization. Had it all itemized, had everything written down. Then they brought these six people to us. It was six people we were baptizing. Uh, And because we were home, so they asked us to double check. We double checked. Every single thing on all six people was exactly verbatim. Exactly. And two of the people were already born again. They were already baptized. And we were able to tell them that one and that one don't need to be baptized. They're already born again. And it was 100% right, okay? And so literally the Lord has given us the ability to see with precision. Now, that's strange that it was 100% right because normally in the interview process, people aren't exactly honest, that they normally don't get everything right. But we do see things with precision, okay? Which is very strange. I understand that's strange. Normally with discerning of spirits with me, when I pray for somebody, I get glimpses, I get insight into what's going on with them. When my brother prays for somebody, I mean my wife, she gets... Bits and pieces. When we pray together, we get the whole story with precision. Just together. She can't do it, I can't do it. Together we can do it. Very strange. But that has afforded us the opportunity to bring information to other people of what's going on behind the scenes. Okay? And if we pray in a certain way, it works. Compared to if you miss one of these steps, other challenges might follow. Okay? And uh, because when we were delivering people at first, we weren't sending them into the pit. And then we'd get visitations at night. Literally, somebody shaking my mosquito net, tapping me on the side, and nobody there. Okay? Somebody visiting my son's room and walking around in his room, going to the neighbors, you know, things like that. Literally, demons wandering around. We don't want that, guys. We want them gone. Okay? So... So as far as the the theological construct, can a Christian have a demon? I'll answer that first question, okay? First of all, I have never seen a demon inside a Christian that was not completely reprobate, okay? I've seen Christians have demons inside of them. But that's just a a theological concept. And this is why. Because a single demon can attack several people at once. They typically reside in somebody given to their primary work. A demon of anger is inside a rageaholic in some prison somewhere or in some non-believer. You know what I'm saying? But he is assigned to attack 10 or 20 other people that he has influence on and attacks. He might not live in that person, but it doesn't matter because he has the same exact impact whether he's inside or outside. 
because he's assigned. There's some open door that permits him to work inside of that person. Okay, though he's not in there. Now, I've expelled demons from, for example, a little boy. And at the same exact time, it was living inside his mom, who was in Nairobi, 450 kilometers away. She immediately went unconscious in Nairobi the second I removed it from him. And then they brought her to the hospital. And then there was nothing wrong with her, of course. Just a demon came out of her. Okay, we've had witchcraft come against our family. And identified it, broke it, it was attacking three people, her, two other people in our compound were sick. Removed it from her, the attack, broke the witchcraft, immediately three people in our compound healed at exactly the same time. Immediately. One of them was my son and said, did you just pray for me? We've seen those things happen so many times. Okay, the demon didn't live in any, th- all three of them. It didn't live in any of them, but it was attacking all of them and had it had influence. You know, there's theological words that I don't find in the Bible, whether, you know, somebody is oppressed compared to possessed, you know, but the truth is they attack. Just accept it. Okay? Our battle's not against flesh and blood, it's against the spiritual forces in the heavenly places. Satan prowls around like a roaring lion looking for somebody to devour. It says, Resist him and he'll flee from you. Well, what do you think happens when you don't resist him? He's going to eat you up. It says, be angry, but sin not. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give the devil a place or a foothold. What do you think happens if you don't repent? If you don't deal with your problems, your sin, you give the devil a place in your life. That's all it is. You're giving him a place. Okay. And most of the time, the entry point is not what we think. Typically, what we see is the entry point is always an emotional wound or trauma. It's typically associated with fear, insecurity, unforgiveness, or rejection. Those four. Okay? Again and again and again. We see one of those four being the entry point. Okay? By the way, they're all sin. You don't think they're sin. The Bible says, don't fear. And of course, we fear. Okay, that's disobedience. The Bible says don't worry. Of course, we worry. <laughs> you know, the Bible says forgive. And of course, we harbor bitterness. You know, so the point is, they are acts of disobedience. They are sins, but we don't see them as sin. They're the acceptable sins. You understand? Uh, and so, a lot of the ways that they attack, uh, for, for non-believers and the carnal, they attack with just the normal vices, you know, addictions and all those different, you know, could be alcohol, drugs, uh, pornography, you know, all, all of those things. They can attack and keep people in bondage, okay? When people overcome those things, especially when you're saved, a lot of times we see the demon no longer has an opportunity, so he gives up. And what he does is he leaves something behind. We've identified as a spirit, okay, that the Holy Spirit has identified to us as a spirit and explained to us that a demon is a thinking being. You have angels, there's bad angels, okay, up top. Then you have demons that are a lower form, okay, they're a lower spiritual being. And then below that, you have something that is placed in your life to have an ongoing work, which the Holy Spirit told us, called, called it a spirit, Okay, and it told us it's like kryptonite for Superman. We found out recently that there's a book about that. We had no idea. Okay, we're in Africa that we don't know there's a book, but that was exactly what the Holy Spirit told us that it's it it doesn't have a mind of its own, but it saps your strength. So you could have a demon of lust attacking you because you're given to pornography and all kinds of other lustful sins. Then you become a Christian, you surrender all those things, but then he leaves this placeholder. It's like a beacon, a light flashing, telling the demonic world that you used to have this weakness. Let's keep poking at it. But let's not waste resources because this guy's safe, safe now. Let's go to somebody else given to lust and live in that person and attack different people. But we're going to leave this ongoing. That's when I was set free from those pornographic thoughts. It was a spirit of lust, this ongoing effect of a former demon of lust when I was given to pornography and fornication and all those sins. You know what I'm saying? And so uh, we see all those. Okay? To the outside, it doesn't matter. When you do a spiritual inventory and you identify all the things that you used to be in, just list them all. 
Because I'm telling you right now, entreat them like demons and command them to leave you. Because it's better to expel a demon that is not there than to let one remain who is. Does that make any sense? And it only costs you a couple words by saying spirit of lust, spirit of anger, spirit of, spirit of everything I've ever participated in. Just name them and commanding them. I bind and rebuke you and I command you to go. I renounce your presence in my life. Go now in Jesus' name and just get rid of it all. Who cares? Okay, if you can't see. Now, when you're praying for somebody else and you've not done an inventory, you want to heal somebody, they have some debilitating sickness. Let's say they have allergies. They can't eat foods. I've, I've, I've delivered people from that. It was a demon. Okay? So I will just bind the strong man over them, which is an angelic host that is in charge. I bind the strong man to get him out of the way so he doesn't interfere. Then I bind the spirit with the highest authority who is causing problems with allergies. And I command them to come with their entire kingdom because there's those in rank under him and around them. Okay? And so I tell them to come with all works, all effects, all orders. Any orders they've received to do this bad stuff because they're just here to disturb. And with all the works and effects, which includes sicknesses. If I know the sickness, I say with that sickness. Okay? And I command them to go into the pit, not to the pit, into the pit. We've literally seen them walk to the pit, look around and come back. In. Send them in with all works, all effects, all orders. When we weren't sending them to the pit, we'd have them wandering around our compound. Okay, or the house of the person we removed them from. You want to get rid of them. And they actually go away when you get rid of them. Okay, with all works, all effects, all orders, with your entire kingdom, go into the pit, burn the orders, lock the gate. Done. You've gotten rid of all of them. But what if there was a curse? We've not dealt with that. Because if you get rid of a demon and there's an ongoing curse and you haven't broken it, that is this beacon that's going to invite another demon with the same work. You got rid of that one, but there's another one coming with the same. You just that if you don't get rid of that curse, that's a help wanted sign right there on you inviting another one to replace it. OK, and so you say, I break, cancel, destroy and all curses against this person in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That'll break witchcraft. That'll break generational curses. That'll break curses of words. We see demons unleashed on people because of words. If you're a parent and you say, oh, your marriage is never going to work, that woman is no good for you. Guess what? You've just unleashed a demon of failure or division. Okay? Just like that. Boom. Your words are extremely powerful. Be careful what you say. Be careful what you say. Because you can unleash a demon by cursing somebody, saying somebody can never, saying somebody won't, somebody whatever. You can unleash something on somebody. Okay? So it's, we see that all the time. See it all the time. Okay, we see witchcraft. Witchcraft is everywhere where we live. It's always defeat and disturbance. Defeat and disturbance. Sometimes it's death. Sometimes people are trying to kill people. Okay? Uh, so, uh, you want to break all those curses, but if it's witchcraft, there's still one more thing as a beacon. Something sending something. So you want to deal with it. What if there was an object? Somebody did some kind of ritual and they have some object. They sacrificed an animal, mixed it with something. They've done something, so there's an object placed somewhere in this person's life. Okay, it could be buried near their property. They could have rubbed something on something. You know what I'm saying? Or thrown something in the air. So what you want to do is you ask the Holy Spirit to go send fire and burn that object. Go burn it. Burn it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got a lot of writing to do. She's my writer. So, do you remember everything? Okay, she remembers. She'll do it. She'll do a good job. We've done a few of these. So, anyway, so that's how to deal with everything in a very practical, practical way. Okay? Find the strong man. You're talking about an angelic host, an angelic uh, power that is assigned for creating, for, for leading the army that is attacking. Okay? The strong man is the top dog. I'm not the strong man, but the prince, the one with the highest authority over you is going to be the one, okay, they, they go by rank, okay? It's like an army, okay? And they, by the way, they don't like each other. It's all by force. They, they don't really get along together. We've, we've had to, we bound them together. That's one thing I didn't say. We bind them together as one. We bind all of them so they'll go as one. Now, if there's one there, for example, if you're trying to heal somebody, and you want the spirit with the highest authority causing asthma, but they have a problem with anger or lust, some sin, the de those demons won't bind with the others and go because they, 
you have to repent for those things. Okay? And to get rid of the one, if you identify anything, you have to renounce them. They won't go unless the, the, uh, the victim renounces them. Unless they're a victim. Things that they're a complete victim of, sometimes they just go. Okay? Like defeat or one of those. But the top one, typically you need to renounce or it won't go. And, and you know, you kind of, you, they typically manifest in some way when they're departing. Even though they don't live there, they, you feel them come and go. And you feel where they worked because something that they have in you has left. Okay? And so I always ask people, did you feel them go? And Cindy can identify where they, came, where they went out. And we ask if they feel it go. And typically they'll feel either a lightness or sometimes they feel pain. Sometimes they feel a temperature change. Sometimes they feel a shiver, something. They'll feel sometimes a stirring or something going on in their body in the area that, that uh, anger is typically you find in the chest. Confusion is typically the head. Bitterness or unforgiveness is typically the stomach. Beyond that, they can be anywhere. You don't know exactly where they're going to be. Those three are the only two that are pretty regular. Almost every time they come out of the same place. Okay, now, recurrence. All this is all great, but remember that the open door is typically some form of emotional trauma. Okay? And so, that emotional trauma, let me, let me confirm we got it all right here. Bind the strong man. Okay, the only one is break all curses, and this is burn objects. Got to burn objects and burn orders. Lock the gate. Bind as one. Okay. The only thing I would add a little is I typically bind them as one and have them go as one unit. Okay. Um, but any sins, you should repent. You need to renounce and release. You'll find some won't go if you've never not forgiven somebody. Uh, then they'll they they don't want to go. Those are the chains that they use to to enslave you. Uh, I can I do this in like 15 seconds. You just pray for the whole thing. You know, I bind the I bind the strong man over this person. I bind the spirit with the highest authority, causing whatever problem. I command you to come with your entire kingdom, with all works, all effects, all orders, right now, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, I break, cancel any curses that are coming against you in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, send fire, burn any objects associated with curses. Now come one. Come as one right now in Jesus' name with all works, all effects, all orders. Go into the pit. Burn all orders and lock the gate in Jesus' name. Okay? Now, if they have any emotional trauma, a sign of emotional trauma is if an event happened in your past that can come to the surface in an instant if somebody else kind of does or says or an event in your life happens that can... Bring that thing to the surface. There's likely a wound to your soul. Okay? And a soul wound is kind of another beacon that invites demonic attack. Just like you have a wound on your body that can bring infection, a wound to your soul can bring a demonic attack. Okay? And so what you want to do, it's quite simple. Have somebody revisit that event, that traumatic event in their mind. Close your eyes. Revisit it. Feel those feelings again. Okay, for 90% of people, this is fine. If you have real trauma, a real kind of stressful event that happened, repressed memories, those things, it requires a lot more work. It's not a like quick session. This is something that requires some counseling. Okay, but for most people, typically it's just something. You know, my father was harsh to me. He didn't, you know, he he ignored me. He was too busy with work or whatever. So I felt rejection. So you have, what does it feel like? You know. And then they, they feel that feeling that they felt neglected and rejected and they just, they were sad, you know. And it's like, then you pray, Lord, heal them, go into their innermost parts and hidden places and heal them, touch them, heal their soul right now, make them whole again, renew their mind, give them the mind of Christ, just a simple prayer, okay. And then you have them revisit it again and see how they feel. Check. And if they don't feel better, ask, was there another event? Is there more? And you go through some emotional healing to close that so that it doesn't become another issue for a, a gateway for another attack in the future. Okay. Now, some people view this as a crutch. You know, they say, oh, you're just blaming everything on the devil, you know. for No. He's there because of the problems. You don't blame the problems on him. You understand? You've given him 
a place. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So when people repent of the challenges that allow attacks in their life, typically I find they don't want those repeat challenges and it gives them more steadfastness to remain holy, to not go back to those things. And so in order to help somebody, to coach somebody to freedom, you want to help them place this buffer around their life. If you know where they attacked historically, then what you want to do is continue to bind the strong man daily. And I believe daily because of this. Because Jesus told us to pray for our daily bread. He didn't say pray for weekly bread, monthly bread, annual bread. He said daily. So I believe praying daily is something. So I pray, bind the strong man over me and my family. If you know problems in other people, you can't get rid of those things. You can get rid of curses, but you're not going to get rid of demons that if they don't cooperate in their deliverance. You can't deliver people without their cooperation. Because number one, they have to be complicit because they have to repent and renounce and release. If they're not repenting, renouncing and releasing, you're not getting rid of anything. Okay? You can do it by force, but it's not going to do any good. By the way, angels are there at your disposal. You can ask angels to help you. You can ask angels. You're good angels, not the bad ones. You can ask them to help you, okay? Uh, but if they're not cooperating, the same problems are going to recur. It's not going to help, okay? So I don't. I don't deliver anybody that doesn't want it unless I know I'm going to be ministering to them immediately because dealing with a rageaholic is impossible. But if you can get rid of that demon of anger, then... You can, co- they can, you can communicate with somebody. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like witnessing to an alcoholic. I mean, you want them to be sober first. So you can sober somebody up. People with a spirit of confusion, crazy people, you can sober them up by delivering them. Then you can preach the gospel to them. You don't delay. So because those things are going to come back if they're not saved. Okay? And so, uh, under normal circumstances, you're trying to deliver people that will be able to protect themselves. Okay? Some people are seriously emotionally damaged. If you don't deal with those emotional problems, it's just going to open right back up. It's not going to be a permanent solution. So if we're doing this to make disciples, guys, which is why we do deliverance, we need to follow through with discipleship. It takes ongoing support to keep somebody free because people who are weak-willed, weak-minded... Very susceptible to repeated attacks. Okay? And so you have to teach them to fight, which is binding the strong man. And then I bind the spirits and you name them the ones that they've had historic problems with. Have them pray that daily. Now, to pray for non-cooperative people, you cannot get rid of them, so you bind them. We have reconciled tons of husbands and wives and prodigal children coming back home because of binding. You can identify what is coming against people by the behaviors in their life. So you bind the spirit of anger, bind the spirit of rebellion, bind, you know, whatever it might be. If they're alcoholics, okay, they can have addiction or or, uh, alcohol. You know, you can bind the spirits and just go after them all. You can bind the spirit with the highest authority causing them to drink. Typically, I see a lot of people, it's defeat, and other people, it's intemperance. Those are the two we see most of. (coughs) By the way, the Holy Spirit doesn't give you the words It gives you the idea, and the words come from your own vocabulary. And so Cindy has a bigger vocabulary than me, and sometimes i got to get a thesaurus out to know what to name these demons. (coughs) Okay, and so you can, and the same thing, there's going to be principalities, which are demons that it could be a lower-level angel or a higher-level demon that are over a region, could be over a church, could be over an area. And you can bind them. You always want to bind them in Jesus' name. Okay? And so, and you'll see changes. You bind them daily. You keep praying, 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 and you'll see remarkable changes. Okay? We have had just dramatic changes in our work area by binding and rebuking, binding and rebuking. Okay? Is that it? That was quick. It was very quick. That's great. We can go to a question answer session. I have mastered teaching this very quickly. I'm keeping it just really practical. I'm keeping it practical. I'm not getting very theological. And like I said, I mean, it works. Uh, we have been doing this for some time now, and we've seen major breakthrough. And so we keep adding more people. We see people getting permanent freedom now. 
Okay, as for specifically with the emotional healing, so there's no recurrence of attacks, uh, things not visiting anybody again, just going and gone. Going and gone. Now, the Bible doesn't detail all this stuff, guys. There's just bits and pieces. We know there's a gift called discerning of spirits in the Bible. It doesn't say what it looks like. Okay? We know that Mary Magdalene had seven demons cast out of her. Well, how did they know that? Because every time Jesus cast out demons, he just told them to go. You know? Uh, it, it's, there's, there's funny little things here and there that you don't know what to make of it. That, that Paul was attacked by a messenger not messenger, angel of Satan, you know, and he tried to get rid of it three times and it was there because of his pride to keep him humble. I'm like, that's a strange thing to say. What does that mean? I'm not sure. It says that, uh, that yeah, if we don't resist the enemy, we're lunch. I mean, that presumption is there. That if we don't, I, you know, if we do let the sun go down on our anger, that we give the devil a place, which I believe that's what that that's a parallel to the communion passage. That some, some people get sick and die if they don't inspect themselves properly. What it's talking about is not dealing with your sin, not repenting, not confessing in the repenting. When somebody doesn't inspect themselves properly for communion and they get sick and die, to me it's just talking about a demonic attack. Okay. I believe that now because of what I've seen. I've seen people demonically attacked when they don't inspect themselves properly, they don't repent. And then all of a sudden they subject themselves to an attack. And so, and it's an attack. Christians are attacked, they hate you. Demons hate you. They will attack you even more than non-believers because non-believers are complicit. They're cooperative. You're not cooperating. And so the first level of attack with the non-believers is going to be the vices, the sins. Okay? When it gets down to the Christians, typically they go after a lot of softer targets. Okay, They'll go after depression, defeat, disturbance, uh, all kinds of emotional challenges. A lot of them, not everything's a demon, by the way. I remember we, somebody brought an autistic child to me. He was an angry boy, and guess what? He had a demon of anger. Got rid of that. He went from being an angry autistic boy to a humble and joyful autistic boy. The autism wasn't a demon. You know what I'm saying? It was a sickness. Okay? Not everything's a demon. Don't blame everything on a demon. But I'm telling you, it's better to cast a demon out that's not there than let one remain. So, pray against it. Say the spirit with the highest authority causing whatever sickness. Go in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then pray for the sickness. Okay? It's just words. It doesn't cost anything, so just pray. Um, and, and so, because I've seen a lot of sicknesses are demons, a lot of conditions are demonic. Okay? Now, when you get rid of a demon that is the cause of a sickness, it does not necessarily mean they're going to be healed. It depends how long it's had influence on them. Okay? So, uh, if, you, if you get a, a flat tire, if you fix it right away, you can just put a patch in it and it's fixed. But if you drive on that thing for a long time, it destroys the tire. And so... When you get rid of a demon that is causing a sickness, if it's something that's recent, they can be healed without even praying for healing. Other times, you need to apply more faith and pray for healing. If it's a degenerative disease that's been there for 30 years, guys, you need to apply a lot of faith to heal it because the damage has been physically done to the body at this point. It's not just a spiritual issue. The body is physically damaged. In Jesus, we can get healing, but it doesn't mean it's going to go away just because a demon caused it. You understand? Because they've caused an ongoing problem that did a lot of damage. Now you've got to fix that damage. That's going to take a lot of the PG or a lot of the F in that equation to make it work. Okay? And so um, we've seen a lot of mental conditions restored. Okay? But not, for example, somebody who had a mental condition that made them like a child. They're 47, 46 years old. Yeah, she, the demons were removed. It was a curse because her grandmother is a witch doctor. Her grandmother is a witch doctor, okay? And um, she, she had remarkable improvement. Before that, she couldn't learn. At 47 years old, if, if it was raining outside and she was outside, she'd just get wet. She wouldn't walk in the house, okay? And so she was useless. She couldn't do anything around the house and was belligerent, angry, you know, uncooperative. Uh, we, we prayed for her, and she was delivered. 
and had remarkable improvement. Well, now she can fetch water, she can clean the house, she's calm and collected and very joyful, and, and she, she learns. So she won't, if it's raining, she'll come in. She'll sweep the house, she'll collect wood, she'll get water, she'll help cook, she, she does things. Okay, so it was a remarkable improvement, but she's not a normal person. She's just not a normal person, okay? And we've seen other people become really more like a normal person. That 38-year-old I was talking about, he works now, okay? And he was 38 years old, and he never worked. Couldn't. Impossible, okay? And so it's different every time. It's not the same every time because it depends what kind of damage they physically do to the body, because their, their job is to torment. Every example in the Bible, it's tormenting, disturbing. You know, they torment, they either mess with the mind, they mess with the emotions, or they mess with the physical body. There was a woman who was bent over for 18 years. It was a demon. When Jesus removed the demon, she was healed. Okay? That can happen. Okay? But it doesn't always happen. So, but dealing with demons, I'll say, is more or less, that's an exact science. Because they respond to orders. They, they, they are rule-based, they're legalistic, they're very responsive. That, compared to healing, totally different. Healing, there are general principles. The equation I put here is there, but it's not 100% because it depends how much faith, how much of God's power. You don't know how much power he is applying. You don't know how much faith. You don't know what his will is. You don't know, you know, so there's, there's, it's, there's a lot more uncertainty with healing than there is with deliverance. Deliverance, uh, specifically if, if you have the gift of discernment, real gift of discernment, it's, it can be an exact science, okay? Much more exact, I'll say, okay? So with that, I will open it up to questions, and I think I've covered what I need to cover. You've been listening to a message by Mark Carrier, who was a missionary in Africa with his wife and 10 children. You can hear and download the same message and other messages in this series at www.livethebible.info. You are free to copy and distribute those messages. For more on Mark's ministry, please go to his website, kingdomdriven.org. Thank you for listening, and may you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ.